You mentioned somebody who came from, uh, not far from here, uh, Fred Hoyle. He had a quite an interesting uh, a quote that you referred to before. Yeah, I don't, don't know who he came from. I don't, don't know his part of it. Not yes, far from here. Not from here. But <coughs> I still believe he's correct. I think we live in a continuously creating universe, not just a Big Bang universe. Oh, I see. And, uh, I think he will be vindicated with that point of view sometime in the next decade or two. You've been, um, you're on the surface of the moon for about nine hours during your trip on Apollo 14. What memories do you have of that nine hours now? Well, I can recall any part of it uh, with a little stimulation, a little stimulation because it was all very fresh in my mind been very fresh in my mind and, and very significant uh, in my life <coughs> and uh, if we just to start and work, walk through it I think I could tell you almost every step that was made <coughs> uh, some of it some of it was a little mundane so it didn't, it didn't stick out but uh, the setting up all the <coughs> equipment on the first EVA and uh, climb up Cone Crater, uh, epitomized by the one photograph we, we've got there. Uh, <coughs> and it being such a tough, tough climb that we ran out of uh, time and water before we could physically go over and look down into Cone Crater, although we were less than 30 feet. Oh, really? We were less than 30 feet from the uh, edge. They didn't know. We, they didn't know that. We didn't quite know that. But they did know we, we used up all of our consumables and had to turn back. And it was uh, only in retrospect when I back process all the way. We're virtually right on the edge. We could have taken ten more steps and looked down into the crater itself. So didn't get a chance to do that. One of the experiences that other astronauts have recalled is that it's very difficult to estimate distances. Oh yes. That is, it was the toughest thing, and we being the first ones to do an exploration on foot, it was that was a part of this major problem that we were talking about. <coughs> the rim of Cone Crater was two kilometers away, uh, almost two kilometers away, and estimating exactly how far the next uh, uh, landmark was and the geologists wanted us to uh, reach certain very specific landmarks mm -hmm. and finding them and seeing them mm -hmm. uh, in what is almost like desert sand dunes was it turned out to be almost impossible and so that's why on the later missions when they when they had a, a, a tracking device they had a they could tell them exactly how far they were from mm -hmm. like a tack hand in aviation how far they were from the lunar module they could navigate far more accurately than we could possibly do. That. Your commander on Apollo 14, uh, Alan Shepard, sadly no longer around, he was also like you a Navy pilot. Did you know him before you became an astronaut? Uh, before he became an astronaut, no, I had crossed his path a couple of times, but we didn't know each other. And do you still meet up with uh, your other colleagues from the NASA space program on a regular basis? Yes, and, and we are. Several of us are on the board of the Astronaut Scholarship Fund that gives uh, scholarships to budding students, 20 of them a year. Uh, and uh, we meet several times a year in support of the Astronaut Scholarship Fund. We are in the middle of a, a a global recession right now. NASA has already experienced some budget cuts. Yeah, when do you think we'll go back to the moon? <coughs> well, the moon isn't in the current planning, but it should be. Because we need to develop near Earth space before we, uh, or as we do, <coughs> distant Earth space. <coughs> but I think uh, the movement of bringing the uh, entrepreneurial community into space flight and exploration is a good move because uh, I use the example just after we invented 
uh, aircraft at the turn of the 20s, getting the 20s here. Okay, the military started using them right away for warfare, <laughs> but then the aviation companies immediately formed by the beginning of the 20s, and we had an airline, the airline industry, and uh, took off at that point, and now a major industry in the world. <coughs> No, I don't think we can expect uh, space flight to develop quite that quickly, but we already know uh, a number of entrepreneurs. I know one that I worked with, uh, Bob Bigelow, uh, you know that name, mm -hmm. who uh, made his money in the hotel business. He wants to have orbiting hotels and uh, uh, going to the moon and coming back uh, as a business. And I know several other entrepreneurs that are <coughs> developing plans for uh, private space industries, which uh, will help us do what we really need to do, so that governments don't necessarily have to do it. Governments have to lead the way and, and give the permission and uh, set the uh, regulations and the laws such that it's doable, but uh, then it's up to the rest of us to go with it. And finally, um, you've been speaking over the last few years about, uh, you're from Roswell, the I'm place in the US famous for the uh, alien spacecraft crash. You seem to come across further evidence that that really did happen. I don't have any doubt about it, yes. The evidence is very strong. <laughs> um, and it's not just Roswell, but there are, there's a lot more evidence. And I, I did go to the Pentagon, Pentagon and get this confirmed. So it's, it's not in my mind, it's not even a doubt, not even a question. Is there any physical evidence you've come across? Well, I don't have any first-hand, haven't had any first-hand contact with aliens. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if you really know the lore, if you really know the people involved, and if you have met and talked with the people who have had, had contact, uh, very shortly cease to have doubts. And uh, then you start to look at what we're seeing from the Hubble Space Telescope mm -hmm. and seeing the expansiveness that we're now seeing, only, only uh, uh, available since Hubble has been there and allowed us to see so much further into the universe and to see the billions of galactic clusters and galaxies out there, each containing billions of stars. Uh, it, we're just a grain of sand. It's our whole solar system is just a grain of sand in the larger scheme of things. And uh, that is a, a new set of ideas for humankind to have to get their head around in our time frame. And since we're not on a sustainable path, we've got to get our head around all of this very quickly before we do ourselves in. You're optimistic for the future, though. I am optimistic if we confront and deal with the problem. But at the moment, certainly in my country, uh, there's a, a lot of resistance to confronting and dealing with the fact, uh, I, I won't use the word uh, global warming, I'll use the word climate change and sustainability, uh, and that we're destroying our, uh, our resources at an alarming rate overpopulating. Now we're starting to bring the population down a little bit, mm -hmm. but overpopulating. And uh, water resources are getting scarce. There's a whole host of uh, a whole host of natural resources that unless we start to uh, harbor them and husband them in a different way, uh, we're going to do us in. And do you ever look at the moon through a telescope these days? Um, well, I, <coughs> I don't have, these days I don't have a telescope immediately in my home. I used to, but I don't today, but I look at it a lot anyhow. Well, you used to, so earlier on, when perhaps you were younger. You well, when I was uh, younger, when I was a student, I made my own telescope. Oh, okay. Yeah, for the fun of it. You know. Right. <laughs> so you really, you started off as an amateur astronomer in some ways. In some ways, yeah. Well, I'm a student of astronomy, a cosmologist, and, uh, and uh, enjoy asking the deep questions about, okay, what's this all really all about? Well, it's very heartening to see that you take time out to talk to youngsters and share your experiences in this way. Well, we, we have to, it's all a part of changing this whole picture of non-sustainability 
<coughs> we have spent almost the entire 20th century uh, coming to grips with the fact that Descartes was wrong in his duality, that body-mind don't interact. Oh. And they do interact, and we can validate that in the laboratory and have over and over and over again. And so building on that and recognizing that we have a direct and profound effect on the way nature is organized and the things that happen in nature is something we have to confront. And uh, that's our responsibility to do that.